Good morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm thrilled that at the end of the homily I get to make uh, two precious friends catechumens in our parish and continue their journey on their journey to converting to the Orthodox faith. It is an awesome privilege and an honor to be able to be a part of the lives of men and women discovering and rediscovering the treasures and the beauties of our precious Orthodox Christian faith. A faith that has lasted for 20 centuries. A faith that is undisturbed by the whim and whimsies of history. And the reason why it's undisturbed by the whim and whimsies of history is the up and down and the ebb and flow of human conditions and human situations. The reason why it isn't disturbed by that is because our Orthodox faith is timeless. Our Orthodox faith is timeless. What does that mean? It simply means that it isn't bound by the changing seasons of human existence. It isn't bound by that. Because it calls us to something greater. It calls us, calls us to something more powerful, more eternal, more everlasting. Something more solid to build our lives upon than the shallow, shifting sands of human times and troubles. I don't know if you realize this or not, but sometimes bad things happen. I don't, maybe, you, maybe you've figured that out by now. Sometimes bad things happen to us. Sometimes good things happen to us. In fact, I never will forget I had a professor in seminary who said, it isn't the problem of evil that's the biggest problem in, the, in philosophy. It's the problem of good. Why is there such a thing as good in the human existence? Oh, what do you mean? Why is there something as such as good? Why, why humans are good? But where did the concept of good come from? Where did, it originate? Where, did it, where did it originate? How did we get the idea that there was something called good? How did we get the idea there was something called beauty? Where does that flow from? It flows, brothers and sisters, because our Creator, the Lord and Maker of the universe, instilled goodness and beauty in His creation. So that when he looked at all that he had made, he said, this is very good. But we humans had other ideas, didn't we? It is amazing to us that we humans many times are our own worst enemies. Maybe you've discovered that. I know I've discovered it myself. In my own life, I find myself my own worst enemy. I'm just like what the Apostle Paul said when he, when he wrote in a place in one of his epistles. He said, the things that I know I should do, I don't do. The things that I know I shouldn't do, I end up doing. Woe is me, who will save me from this body of death? But thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. The message of our Orthodox faith preserved for 20 centuries is a message that calls men and women to something greater than their own thoughts, something greater than their own ideas, something more majestic and more beautiful and more eternally valuable than the temporary desires of a life focused only on my own pleasure, on my own ideas, on my own desires. The reason why the Lord Jesus Christ established a church was to throw a group of people together and see if they'd live. Look at the two men that we remember today, Saints Peter and Paul. Two men could not have been more different than these two fellows. Peter, a fisherman. Not an educated man. Not someone who went to the finest schools in Jerusalem. Not someone who had a lot of money or had a lot of prestige or had a lot of, of polish and decorum. Why, Peter struggled even to keep his mind straight in times of trouble. Peter was an impetuous man, a loud man. Now, now you understand why I like him so much. Peter was a man who said the wrong thing at the wrong time most of the time, except when he didn't. Peter was a guy who would rush in where angels fear to tread. He just didn't care about what the decorum was or what the proper etiquette was. He just simply did it. And that got him in trouble more than anything else. But when he was right, Peter was spot on. 
And the difference in Peter's life was that Peter loved Jesus Christ. Peter loved him. Peter didn't just fear him. Peter didn't just stand in awe of Jesus Christ. Peter loved Jesus Christ. That love was tested when Jesus was arrested and Peter failed the test. But Peter had a chance to repent. Would to God Judas would have stayed connected long enough to give his ch- get his chance to repent. Choices make all the difference in the world, folks. The loss of hope is one of the greatest enemies of our Christian maturity. But Peter had a chance to repent, and he did. Paul, on the other hand, was very well educated. By all intents and purposes, probably a wealthy man. He was a Roman citizen and a Jew. And he was a leader in the Jewish religious structure, probably a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish religious court of the day. Peter, Paul was a very well-educated man, having learned the Jewish faith and Jewish theology from one of the greatest Jewish thinkers of the day, Gamaliel. He was the disciple of this great Jewish leader and knew the scriptures backward and forwards. He was educated and he was proud and he was zealous. He loved the rules. Paul loved the rules. So much so that when these Christians started showing up and saying that God had a son, why, how dare they? And he rose up and said, I'll smite these people. And he was, he was, he was uh, zealous for the faith. He wanted to make sure that all the rules were followed because following the rules was the most important thing. So much so that, Peter, that Paul was the Sanhedrin member of the court that gave permission for our first martyr to be stoned, St. Stephen, the deacon. Paul stood by. He was called Saul at that time. Saul stood by and gave judicial coverage to the death sentence given to St. Stephen. Paul got arrest warrants from the leaders of the Jewish people to go to Damascus and arrest the Christians because after Stephen had been stoned, a lot of the leaders went over to Damascus, frankly, to hide. And so he got arrest warrants to go to Damascus and arrest the Christians there and bring them back in shackles and show these crazy Christians that they shouldn't do what they're doing. On the way to Damascus, the scripture says that Paul had a vision And a voice came from heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was knocked off his horse and he looked up in the sky and he said, who are you, Lord? And the voice from heaven said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. I always wondered what that phrase meant and what it was was Saul's zealotry, Saul's desire to follow the rules was pricking his conscience because he knew what he was doing was wrong. And Saul, as hard as he can, was fighting the direction and the leading of the Holy Spirit to repent for his actions. And he kept saying no, but now he couldn't say no any further. He'd run as far as he could. And then, of course, Saul's name was changed to Paul. And these two great men, Peter and Paul, lived in conflict with each other (laughs) and with those around them. Peter and Paul would get along and love one another. In fact, we have an icon here of Saints Peter and Paul embracing one another. The wonderful truth of all this, if these two men could get along in the church, we should be able to too. If these two very, very different men could get along to find a way to live together in harmony, to understand that our faith is bigger than our differences. Our faith is larger and more powerful than our disagreements. 
Our faith and our love for Jesus Christ should overcome all of the challenges of our lives and break down those stony parts of our heart that keep us angry and bitter and separated from one another. Our faith is meant to heal, not meant to divide. Our faith is meant to create harmony, not meant to create chaos. In fact, the scripture goes on to say that God is not the author of confusion. And so these two powerful men that we remember today are men who came from different backgrounds. Peter ministered to his Jewish people. Paul was accused of being a traitor to his tribe because he went beyond his tribe and reached out to the Gentiles. The Jews got upset at him for hanging around all those Greeks. Because the Jews considered the Greeks barbarians and disconnected from God. But Paul loved people outside his tribe and he ministered to them. And together, these two heroes of the faith met their martyrdom in the city of Rome around 66 to 68 AD. Peter was crucified upside down because he refused, he said, to be crucified as his Lord Jesus was crucified because he was unworthy to die as Christ did. And so they turned his cross upside down and crucified him upside down. Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, was not subject to the death penalty on a cross. A Roman citizen, the way they killed Roman citizens, they beheaded them. And so Paul was beheaded in the city of Rome under, during the time of Nero. And these two great men set the pattern for the gospel of Jesus Christ to spread throughout the entire world, even coming to us here in Cumming, Georgia, to this day. That faith that they proclaimed is the same faith we declare unapologetically this morning in this place. A faith that heals. A faith that makes whole. A faith that heals brokenness and creates unity and encourages love and forgiveness and embracing of one another. Not bitterness and anger and fighting one another, but a message of faith that is so timeless that it can bring two very different men like Peter and Paul together to serve the common good of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. My precious brothers and sisters today, the lessons of St. Peter and Paul come to us this morning in this house. And we are asked if we have the courage, the grace, the insight, the wisdom to embrace something bigger than ourselves, something bigger than our prejudices, our backward thinking, our own fears and to embrace a courageous future, the future that Christ has laid before us in the gospel of His Son. Amen.